British planes were used to fly in and strafe the Moneda Palace. British arms killed the revolution and killed the government of Chile. Neoliberalism essentially is a hustle. It's a hustle that pretends to be a philosophy. After the coup, Chile was a laboratory for that. The laboratory of the destruction of the welfare state in so many places around the world. Neoliberalism essentially is like that pillow that gets put on a person's face, on society's face. After a point, you can't breathe. Kissinger, the CIA, the US government, the British government, they knew what was going on. They knew the brutality, they knew the torture. I was brought in here, sat on a chair, with people surrounding me. I was blindfolded. They had equipment to apply electricity. I don't know, I can't describe them. I, don't, I never felt that type of pain again. You just cannot imagine that a human being can do that to another human being on purpose, consciously. They used beatings and they used hanging, but later on, they used techniques of torture that the CIA had trained the military on. This woman not only was a torturer, but she also trained dogs, to sexually attack women. Two days after the coup, I was arrested and shot while being arrested. And I survived just miraculously because the bullet passed near my thorax, entered my left arm and exit to the left arm. I was shot without any provocation. And yet I was charged of attacking the military forces. And I was detained in the National Stadium for a month. People were being tortured there and many people who were even less active than me, were shot and killed. After they were being killed, they were put on a sack, taken by helicopter and thrown to the Pacific Ocean. Those names, hundreds and hundreds, they thousands of names of young people, full of determination and hope of the kind of society they could create. Throughout my life, I have felt a huge responsibility of doing whatever I can to keep their memories alive and to make sure they're never forgotten. When I first arrived in Chile in 1969, it didn't take long to pick up the ferment of the political atmosphere. Because I'd just come from Argentina, which was a military dictatorship. I'd come from Paraguay, which was a military dictatorship. Brazil, which was a military dictatorship. I came to Chile, it was very different. Socialist party symbols all over Santiago, marches, demonstrations, meetings, demands, hope, expectation. It was so different to all the other places. And that was infectious. And I was infected by it. It was a very nice time to be a student. We were really building a new world, a world, a society that was going to be better for everybody. The agenda was there because I felt that all the measures that he was taking were really favoring, benefiting the people of my class, the poorest of the country. When Allende was elected in 1970, I was 15 years old. My parents were actors and socialists. There was a huge popular movement of support for Allende. In Britain, we were just ecstatic. Somebody who stood for election as a socialist, who'd spent his life fighting for human rights and social justice, had become the president of Chile. All the changes they started to bring in, the public ownership, the building of houses, improvement of education, feeding of children, real rights for indigenous communities, rights for women, and so much hope was in that government and the changes they brought in. Then the pressure pressure of the lies and the disinformation against Salvador Allende. No tengo otra alternativa. Solo acribillándome a balazos podrán impedirme voluntad que hay que hacer cumplir el programa del pueblo. When the Socialist Party of Salvador Allende began to make moves towards taking control of the government, there was a real fear in Washington, D.C. and of course in the head offices of largely U.S.-based multinational corporations that the copper would be nationalized. And if anybody who lives in the modern world doesn't understand the power of copper, well, 
you need to go and look at your phone you need to understand how your computer functions copper is completely essential to the modern world and that's the reason why the us government in cahoots with the chilean oligarchy attempted to suffocate allende before allende even started government the right wing in conjunction with the military staged the assassination of the commander in chief of the army general rene schneider the economic strangulation of chile by big business the promotion of the military by the international community the work of kissinger and the cia all undermining a legitimate democratically elected government the emblematic statement is made by nixon to henry kissinger where he says we have to make the economy scream we have to make the situation in chile so completely difficult that a coup will be justified when it happens that when the military eventually moves against the government of allende there will be a lot of people who will say allende's government messed up the economy they blame allende of course people would say we have nothing to eat there is no transport but the united states blocked all the credits to chile and made life absolutely impossible there was a huge inflation there was a complete wrecking of chilean economy and yet and this is the important thing the vote for allende increased from 36% in 1970 to 43% and the eve of the coup in march 1973 so the people could see through all this the political conscience of the working class in chile and the poor in chile was so high that people didn't mind because they knew que el compañero allende was going to be making things better for people and he got more votes and then is when the united states and the wrong way people in chile realized that they were not going to overthrow allende through democratic means and they started putting in place the coup When the coup took place on September the 11th, 1973, a friend phoned me and told me what was going on. He worked at Reuters as a copy taker, and I was just shocked, saddened. We just went to the Chilean embassy and formed up a demonstration in support of the people of Chile. Our job was solidarity with the government and the people of Chile. It wasn't up to us to decide the tactics. Our job was solidarity with them. The day the coup happened at around 10 a.m. in the morning we were in the medical faculty and we heard one of the speeches of Salvador Allende saying confirming that the coup was underway and that he was not going to resign. Digan ustedes sabiendo que mucho más temprano que tarde de nuevo abrirá la grande salameda por donde pase el hombre libre para construir una sociedad mejor. Viva Chile. British planes, Hawker Hunter jets, sold by Britain to Chile, were used to fly in and strafe the Moneda Palace, and Salvador Allende died in that palace. British arms killed the revolution and killed the government of Chile. Two days after the coup, I was arrested. and shot while being arrested and i survived just miraculously because the bullet passed near my thorax enter my left arm and exit so the left arm i was shot without any provocation and yet i was charged of attacking the military forces and i was condemned to 400 and something days in prison and then taken to the national stadium uh, just behind me here More than a year after the coup, I was detained on the 6th of December 1974, a day that certainly I will never forget. My family didn't know anything about me for a month, almost a month. This is called the tower. In my case, prisoners were brought here as soon as they came, and downstairs they had equipment to apply electricity. I was brought in here, sat on a chair with people. surrounded me I was blindfolded I don't know I can't describe them I don't I never felt that type of pain again 
just cannot imagine that a human being can do that, not a human being on purpose, consciously. I was detained in the National Stadium for a month. People were being tortured there and some of them being killed. And, uh, and it was a horrible thing. I mean, I saw the son of the Secretary General of the Communist Party, who after the session of torture was paraded through the middle of the football pitch, just to tell us what would happen to us if we did not collaborate with what they wanted from us. Then I was transferred to another place. The Venda Sexy was a place that was also called the discotheque because it was characterized for the application, not only of torture, but of torture that was of sexual nature to women and few men. That's where I was transferred and I was there for over two weeks. I just didn't think it was real what I was going through. I just, I was thinking that it was something in the bad dream that I was going to wake up at any moment, that it couldn't, it couldn't be true what I was seeing. At that time, they used beatings and they used hanging, but later on, they used techniques of torture that the CIA had trained the military on. These are techniques that were developed Many of them by the French in Algeria, they trained the Americans to apply in Vietnam. There's a famous CIA torture manual called Kubark, and these techniques were used in Chile. This woman not only was a torturer, but she also trained dogs to sexually attack women. And it's all true that happened in La Venda Sexy, and hence the name. Those dogs were especially trying to do that. Finally, many of these people, it was learned later, after they're being killed, they were put on a sack, taken by helicopter, and thrown to the Pacific Ocean with pieces of railway so that they would sink to the bottom of the sea. I consider myself very lucky to have survived. Um, many people who were even less active than me were shot and killed. Anyone who expressed uh, support for Allende could be killed. In the cemetery at Ricoleta, there's a whole area with unmarked graves of people who were just dumped in the ground by the military as they were killed in the stadium and other places. I'm standing alongside the grave of Victor Hara. Victor Hara was an inspiration to a whole generation of people in Chile. He sung for the miners, he sung for the students, he sung for the women, he sung for the poor people of Chile. When the military coup came, he was very quickly arrested by the military. They smashed his hands so he couldn't play his guitar anymore, and then they shot him dead. He was killed because he sung for the revolution and he sung for the people. saw the huge memorial to Salvador Allende and his family, and then just saw those names, hundreds and hundreds, say thousands of names of young people, young people full of determination and hope of the kind of society they could create. To think that they, they deprived all these young people and all these people of the opportunity to fulfill their lives, to be able to be mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandparents, and for the only reason that they wanted to build a, a, a more just society. Throughout my life I have felt a huge responsibility of doing whatever I can to keep their memories alive and to make sure they're never forgotten. I just feel angry. We didn't do enough. We should have done more. We should have done more. We should have been stronger. The British government was supplying arms to Pinochet. And all the while, Kissinger, the CIA, the US government, the British governments of Heath and Thatcher, they knew what was going on. They knew the brutality. They knew the torture. Yet they said, Chile is changing. It's developing economically. Milton Friedman was here imposing free market economics and destroying the public services that had been created 
by the popular unity government led by Salvador Allende. In my opinion, the term neoliberalism is really quite exaggerated in its importance. Okay, Neoliberalism essentially is a hustle. It's a hustle that pretends to be a philosophy. Chile was a laboratory for that because after the coup, these so-called Chicago boys essentially brought these quote-unquote ideas. They said, let's take areas of human activity that were quite well managed by the state or by local entities and let's sell them into the private sector and then price people out from being able to enjoy them. This was the laboratory of the destruction of the welfare state in so many places around the world. Later put into operation by Ronald Reagan in the USA in 1980, Margaret Thatcher in Britain from 79 onwards. There was an economic crisis in 1983, so bad that the people start spontaneous protests in the poor neighborhoods of Santiago. People were not prepared to put up anymore with Pinochet. This was, by that time, 10 years of absolute terrorism on the population. But now, also, they were inflicting economic terrorism on the population and people had enough. When you're sleeping in your bed and somebody comes and puts a pillow onto your face and shoves the pillow harder and harder and you have a hard time breathing, you're going to fight and push the pillow off. Neoliberalism essentially is like that pillow that gets put on a person's face, on society's face and starts to take as much of your breath as possible. After a point, you can't breathe. You're totally suffocated and you push back. When Pinochet left power and there was a transition to democracy, a lot of people had high hopes that things will change and there would be a reversal, particularly of the neoliberal economic policies that produce extreme inequality in Chilean society. But that's not what happened. When the coup regime had to retreat, when the military had to return to the barracks, three things didn't take place. The first is there was absolutely no accountability for the crimes of the coup regime. Mr. Pinochet, the general who ran the coup regime, died a very happy man in his bed. Secondly, there was no new constitution written immediately. The coup constitution of 1980 lasts till now. The constitutional convention is writing a new constitution. That's amazing. That's 42 years later. That means that the government had to exist on that constitution written by an illegal coup regime. And the third thing that didn't happen was the government that came in the 1990s just continued this whole policy of privatization, commodifying areas of public life and so on. In other words, neoliberalism didn't change a thing. By 2005, we'd see a deepening of the Pinochet economic model, greater inequality, and privatization of every aspect of Chilean life. No wonder generations of school children took to the streets to protest the fact that public transportation was privatized and too expensive. No wonder there's discontent in the society over pensions, a major issue. So the protest culminated in a big uprising in 2019, where in difference to previous protests that were sectoral, students here, the people who were fighting for water rights there, they all came together and there was a massive uprising of the people in 2019. And it was of an intensity never before experienced in this country. Para mí es como una olla a presión, ¿no? Que por años acumuló descontento y que el 18 de octubre finalmente decidió de alguna manera explotar ante la no respuesta de los gobiernos y particularmente también del Estado de Chile. Por mucho tiempo jugamos un rol desde el movimiento social, marchando, organizándonos, gestionando, pidiendo reuniones con autoridades que tomaban decisiones por nosotros. Y nos dábamos cuenta que muchas veces tocábamos chocábamos contra una pared. Nosotros desde el movimiento estudiantil siempre pensamos en que era necesario remover el poder. Y bueno, y hoy día somos parte del gobierno nuevamente, pero ya no solo del gobierno de otros, sino que de nuestro gobierno. 
35-year-old Gabriel Boric will become the new president of Chile, a leftist former student leader promising major investments in public spending, canceling student debt, and raising the taxes of the wealthy. Un gobierno feminista, de un gobierno ecologista, siempre vinculados con la lucha del movimiento social, porque en Chile al menos yo no recuerdo ningún proceso de transformación real y profunda que no sea acompañado de un movimiento social activo. Chile is the most divided country in Latin America. It's not a poor country, but it's the most economically divided country in the whole continent. That is a challenge that faces Gabriel Boric and his new government. President Boric got the largest vote ever of any presidential candidate. They have a massive mandate. They do have political stresses with the lack of complete control of the Congress and the Senate. And there is going to be opposition to the redistribution of power and wealth. The right wing in Chile today are stronger than they were at the time when they overthrew Salvador Allende. Because everything is privatized. They're making money every minute you breathe the air. They're making money of you as a Chilean citizen. So I am afraid of the way they will use that power to prevent any change from happening in Chile. It may take the form of a military coup, I doubt it but it will probably take the way of the lawfare applied against the Brazilian President Lula or many other ways in which you can make the whole process grind to a halt. You have to marry the movement of the grassroots with the executive action of the new government. Por más que este sea un gobierno que tiene una aspiración y una vocación de transformación profunda, Siempre van a haber desde la institucionalidad fuerzas que van a tratar de retroceder, de evitar que los cambios se produzcan. Y ahí lo único que lo puede garantizar es el pueblo organizado. Son los estudiantes y las estudiantes organizadas y organizados. Es el movimiento feminista, es el movimiento sindical, son los trabajadores y trabajadoras, son los actores sociales, los protagonistas, las protagonistas los que pueden garantizar que la vocación de transformación que tenga un gobierno o una institución se materialice en términos reales. Look, I'm not confident that the government in Chile is going to very easily slot itself into left-wing currents on the continent. When you talk to people in the new government in Chile, they will tell you that the main issues are pension reform and so on. These are internal issues. Of course, you can't reform pensions inside Chile without raising revenue. If you're going to raise revenue, you're going to have to increase royalties from your copper mines. If you're going to do that, you're going to have to confront American, Australian, Chinese multinational corporations. International issues are in the middle of what is a domestic issue. They can't be separated out. We are going to see more and more public unrest of different kinds. Whether this public unrest will remain the unrest of the streets or whether it will be able to produce political projects that redefine how states operate, that's to be seen. To me, this is a time of the most amazing strength and hope that free market economics can be consigned where they belong to the dustbin of history. You can bring about a society of social justice for the good of all of the community. And I absolutely wish them well. I am hopeful for a Boris government. Hope is the last thing that you should lose. I think that you have to act with the optimism of will and the pessimism of reason. Poetry and music have always been very much part of the political life in Chile. One of the great poets of Chile, Pablo Neruda, left us great words and great memories. You can cut down all the flowers, but you cannot stop the coming of spring. The coup happened in September, which in Chile is the beginning of spring. Neruda's spring took a while to come, but it's come.
If you want to see more of these fascinating and wonderful documentaries from different parts of the world and different struggles, but above all, stories of hope, then join in. Support Double Down News on Patreon.